thank you so much for the introduction and uh, for the invitation. It's such a great uh, pleasure to be here. First, can you hear me in the back? <clears throat> so first, I would like to say, especially for students, please ask questions during the talk. I would actually be happy to answer questions. And first, I have a question for you. Who actually ever used a GPS? Raise your hand. Well, then you used an atomic clocks. Because on a GPS, our GPS is based on uh, <clears throat> atomic clocks. But let's say GPS has been around for a long time. So those satellites with atomic clocks on them, those are not very modern atomic clocks. So those are orders and orders of magnitude worse than it's actually possible in the current time. And those clocks on the GPS satellites are based on transitions in atom-specific cesium. But those were microwave transitions in the microwave uh, spectral region. Things improved a lot since those clocks have been launched on the GPS. And this is a fractional frequency uncertainty, essentially to how many digits you know you uh, can compare your clock frequency. And that was a progress with the microwave clocks. And as you see, it's pretty much flattened out. There are technical reasons why you can't keep building microwave clocks better and better. So, and now we switch to the different spectral region, to the optical transitions. <coughs> and you see how fast the progress was. So now we are actually at the level of 18 significant figures in uncertainty of our clock. OK, that's just such a small number, it's kind of hard to imagine. So let's put it in perspective. This clock will not lose one second in more than a lifetime of the universe, in 30 billion years. So those are extraordinary precise devices. So first, let's talk about what are those atomic clocks. And first, let's talk about what actually is a clock. So what do you need? to build a clock. OK, first you need some sort of system with periodic behavior. OK. Let's start with uh, Earth going around the sun. It's pretty periodic. <clears throat> and if I need to know where I'm harvesting my potatoes, that's pretty good. It gives a pretty good idea when to do that. Pendulum now has a period of, you know, you have a half a second. So, of course, this allows you to tell, you know, what the dinner time is. Not good enough for GPS. So the more, the larger frequency you have for your periodic behavior, the more precise will be your clock. And then you need to count the cycles to produce time interval, which is kind of trivial for, you know, Earth going around the sun or the pendulum. And then you have to agree on the origin of time, because we have to start counting time from something. And that's where the atoms come in. Atoms are perfect oscillators. They all are the same. So all atoms are exactly the same if, of course, it's the same species of the atom. So atom of rubidium here, atom of rubidium there, it's always going to be the same atom. And uh, in uh, absolutely the same environment, those are exactly the same oscillators. So we have a gift from nature of something on which we can build a perfect clock. And then what we have to do, we take a sample of atoms. And in case of trapped ions, they actually operate with a single ion. So it's a single quantum system. That's why all of those technologies, these are quantum sensors. Those are intrinsically quantum uh, devices. And of course, you can keep your iron there for a while. I mean, you can name your iron as a pet if you keep it there for a few months. And of course, eventually you get a new iron. Uh, Pete will tell you much more, of course, in Murray about uh, trapping ions and keeping them in traps. And then you build a laser in resonance with this atomic frequency, and then you count the cycles uh, of the signal. And uh, <clears throat> if we go in more details of how that works, so you have your perfect atomic transition. And you tune your laser approximately on resonance of this transition. And then you have see, you see, did atoms make the transition or atoms didn't make the transition? And then you tune the frequency of your laser 
and you move more and more and more the curve, and eventually you achieve the maximum population. For the quantum uh, information people in the audience, essentially what you do here, you initialize your system in, a, you know, in state one, and then effectively you apply Hadamard gate. It's a pyro two pulse. And you make a sort of position, and then you just wait for you know, your vector evolve on the block sphere, and then you bring a sort of position back, and then you measure the population. So this is your Ramsey scheme sequence. And then, at the point when you actually measured what is your central frequency, then you count it with your frequency comp. So this is a basic idea of how the clocks work, the optical the clocks. This is how it looks. Okay, I'm a theorist. So it's amazing that all of that all works at the same time, but of course, uh, that, I have to say, if I were to uh, give you a picture of how a quantum computer with trapped ion looks like, it pretty much looks the same. At least to me, the theorist. Okay, and this is actually, you know, this one clock which will not lose, you know, one second in uh, a lifetime of a universe. And I have to say, okay, this is a tabletop device. Okay, few tabletops, because there is a frequency comp there, there's a laser there somewhere. And of course, there is a marvelous effort to make those devices portable. And eventually, one of them will fly to space. But this is going to uh, be a very, very interesting uh, next 10 years. These atomic clocks are so precise at this point that if I take my clock, okay, I put a, you know, hydraulics under the table and I lift my table about just one centimeter. You can tell the difference. The clock tick rate will detect at 10 to the minus 18 level one centimeter in height. So this is one of the amazing devices to actual relativistic geodesy to measure the Earth's gravitational potential. And this is needed for many, many applications for geodesy, for climate studies, <clears throat> and for many other things. For example, in Europe, apparently you can actually measure the height pretty well. If you ever have seen this chronometric leveling, like people like, have those apparatus and look uh, at a straight line, and you can measure the height differences. You can do it very precisely for, say, 100 kilometers or so. The problem is that in Europe, each country measures its own zero height from their own tidal gauge. And some of them are differing by like 50 centimeters. They would love to have those clocks at those tidal gauge points. Or for example, to see how the mountains raise and fall in real time. People think that you may be actually to get enough data to start predicting earthquakes just because you can see how the earth moves in real time. Or uh, I've been told at eight, 10 to the minus 18 level, you can start seeing if the volcano magma chamber starts to filling in. Okay, you need about a cubic kilometer of magma at this point, so. So there are many interesting, very applied reasons, besides, of course, a GPS, uh, why you want those clocks. And one of the applications, very long baseline interferometry. Who's seen the picture of the black hole? That was done with a uh, long uh, baseline interferometry. And now, of course, the second is defined as a <clears throat> through the atomic clock, now through cesium. Also, clocks are great many body devices. When you have a clock with optical lattices, you actually have a quantum degenerate gas, uh, quantum degenerate atoms sitting in each of their own sites, and you can actually do very interesting many body simulations. But what I will talk about today is to use clocks for search for physics beyond the standard model. And of course, we have to first define which standard model are we talking about, this one. This is everything we know about building blocks of the universe. So we have all of our particles and all of our fields. And this standard model explains a great many experiments exceptionally well. For example, quantum electrodynamics is a part of this model, and that has been extremely great successful. <clears throat> Unfortunately, we know that there are problems with the standard model. <clears throat> and know that you have like a couple of sigma here deviation, maybe three sigma deviation here, some neutrinos are disappearing and not appearing where they're supposed to be. 
we actually have much more serious problems with the standard model. If standard model were true the way it is, the universe will not exist. Because you see, with the standard model, at the Big Bang, you produced almost exactly the same amount of matter and antimatter. The disbalance is very, very small, not enough for us to exist. And of course, we have you know, matter plus antimatter, what it does, or it annihilates, and there'd be light. So if the standard model were true, there wouldn't be any galaxies, and we will not be sitting here. And that's actually a very, very serious problem that you actually need to introduce more particles in order to explain this. And then, of course, we have this great big elephant in the room that we don't know what universe is made of. That standard model which I showed, that's 4%. That's it. And the rest of it, it's a dark matter and dark energy. We know that those are two different things, but we don't know where they are, what they are. Let's put it this way. We know even less about dark energy than we, don't, we know about dark matter. But we don't know what either of those things are. We just uh, have experimental evidences that do exist, which I'll talk about. And then, besides the standard model, we also have fundamental physical postulates. For example, how many of you ever compared your experiment with somebody else's? Raise your hand. So what do we assume when we make those comparisons? Well, we assume Lorentz invariance, right? You rotate your experiment, and if you're comparing with somebody else on Earth, it is being rotated. Or if you move your experiment, the results should not change. Then position invariance, it shouldn't really matter where that experiment is. And then, <clears throat> the equivalence principle, it really shouldn't matter what system that is beyond the properties of those systems. And then we assume that fundamental constants, which are in this NIST database, are actually constant. And then, of course, we assume the standard model, that those are only forces and interactions. And we already know that it's definitely highly incomplete. And why do we assume those things? Because this has been experimentally verified at some point, at certain level. <clears throat> so atomic clocks are now in completely uncharted territory. Those postulates have not been tested at the level of the clock precision at this time. In fact, the clocks are actually the ones who do actually set up limits on a large number of those things. So according to particle physics, this actually not true in most of this beyond the standard model models. This is not true in any of the quantum gravity models. And this is not true in many of the dark matter scenarios or any of the other beyond the standard model physics. So it's quite possible that just by comparing and building more and more precise clocks and other quantum sensors, such as uh, atom magnetometry and interferometry, are uh, also many other, some of the quantum formation, uh, trapped iron, for example, experiments can already set limits on some of the extra forces. By doing all of those interesting new comparisons, we actually may actually find a new physics. And that's what this talk is about. Any questions? So today, we will talk about the searches for possible violation of all of those fundamental principles, and specifically searches for the dark matter. And uh, this is actually a very large area, and I will specifically talk about atomic clocks, but if you're interested in a much larger review of essentially the entire field of the searches for new physics with atoms and molecules, then we recently wrote a review, and uh, there is more than 100 pages and more than 1,100 references in there. Most of them are past 10 years. So it's a very, very new recent field. Why clocks are such great systems to search for new physics? <clears throat> it's because if your new physics actually changes energy levels, that it will shift this very frequency. <clears throat> and different clocks actually have different sensitivities to this new physics. 
So by comparing two different clocks, one is sensitive to new physics, one is not, over time, you can tell whether you have these new effects which are not accounted for. So for experimentalists, this is like a nightmare scenario. That's a systematic which you really, really don't know about. Because no one in the world knows about it. This is something totally and completely new. And of course, you can build dedicated experiments which are specifically designed to look for those effects. So uh, there are actually quite interesting uh, variety of new physics you can look with atomic clocks. Look at the variation of fundamental constants in the related dark matter searches, search of the violation of Lorentz invariance, test of equivalence principle, and there already been proposal of actually how to do gravitational wave detection with atomic clocks. You need a couple more orders of magnitude here. And uh, you probably need to be in space. But nevertheless, those are already technologies which are comparable to laser interferometry and devices. First, let's start with the variation of fundamental constants. OK, what constants are fundamental? OK, if you can open any textbook, and here is a list of constants, right? Well, the ones which we really cannot calculate from any first principles, these are fundamentals. These are the ones which have to be measured. These are ultimate property of our universe. For example, the fine structure constant, it defines the strengths of electromagnetic interaction, and this is fundamental. Ratios of electron to proton masses, ratios of quark masses to the QCD scale. And in many, many different new physics theories, those things are actually not constant. In any of the theories with extra dimension, any of the attempts to unify fundamental interactions, these are not constant. Well, the question is by how much? Unfortunately, we don't know. So we will look for this possible variation. So if alpha varies, it's a fine structure constant, then, of course, because you have a dependence on the Rydberg constant in alpha and additional dependence on alpha for the, your optical transitions, your frequency of all of your transitions, including your clock transitions, will depend on alpha. Alpha changes, the frequency changes, right? So then the key point here that it's different for different clocks. So some clocks are very sensitive, and some clocks are less sensitive. So in this case, especially if you have a clock based on a heavy system, this is much more relativistic system, and it has much more dependence on alpha. So you pick two different systems which have different dependencies, and then you measure their ratio, and then while well, you do it for a while. I mean, how a while? Well, that depends how long is your grant, uh, uh, when your graduate student graduates, or you know uh, whether you have a heredity data from the previous people in the lab. So I think the longest running comparisons, and of course, it hasn't been running all the time, but rubidium cesium fountains have data for 15 years at this point, and they are the longest running, and hydrogen majors. But the precision of those are not as good as the current atomic optical clocks. OK, running uh, comparisons uh, of uh, new optical clocks for years, this is something which is going to be a very interesting thing over the next decade. And the interesting point is I've mentioned that the clocks can have vastly different sensitivities to those effects. <clears throat> but how do we know which clock is sensitive and which is not? Well, I'm a theorist. I can calculate it for you. In fact, this is one of the very few quantities we can calculate extremely well. So I'm going to take my energy level, and I'm going to express it as a dependence on the alpha. All I have to do is to dig somewhere in my code, find constants, constants, where is the constants? OK, here's alpha. OK, change the alpha by, say, 0.1%, rerun the code, change it by minus 0.1%, and then just to calculate the slope. That's my Q. Don't forget to change this back. There have been precedents of people looking for those things. It's this little, little tiny difference which appears everywhere, but doesn't really come from the code anymore. Okay. So now, if you have two clocks which you can compare at the level of 10 to the minus 18, which we have now, this already exists, and the UK factor would be 100, which doesn't yet exist. 
then you get essentially a factor of 100 for free. And you don't have to deal with all this, you know, one height centimeter difference between your two clocks and all the temperature dependence and all the other those interesting effects hard to deal with. So even as a theorist, I see it's much easier to measure larger effects. So the larger your enhancement factor, the better. Unfortunately, this is completely defined by whatever system you picked as your clock. So, for example, the best now measured ratio of two clock transitions to set the limit on alpha variation done with mercury plus to aluminum plus. And mercury plus has sensitivity factor of about minus three, and aluminum plus is very light. So this is a reference. Its sensitivity is 0 0.01, for all purposes zero, so total sensitivity is three. And that's now gave actually the best limits in alpha variation. The largest k factor from all operating clocks is minus six right now. Most of them are closed between zero and one. And that is a problem, which I will tell you how to solve. So now, this would have been a story five years ago. OK, changing fundamental constants, very nice. They probably change. OK, we'll just keep waiting, keep comparing our clocks. But the game changed when it was realized that the dark matter can actually change fundamental constants. And then everything became so much more interesting because now my clock is my dark matter detector device. In fact, the GPS, it's a dark matter detection sensor. By the way, a very expensive one. So how would this work? So first, let's pose our questions. Which kind of dark matter will affect the energy level? And then, what can I detect if I can do it to 20 significant figures? It will project a bit in the future, minus 18, minus 20, good enough. So uh, when talking to particle theorists, we already can talk about the future. Because they always think about next collider anyway. So by 10 years, we'll have uh, definitely 10 to the minus 19, maybe 10 to the minus 18. But uh, when talking about dark matter, I found a problem. I remember chatting very excitedly about dark matter searches to my quantum information colleague. And then he said, like, oh, dark matter. You believe in that, right? So why do I believe in dark matter? <clears throat> well, we have enormous experimental evidence that that exists. What you may have heard about, that rotational curves, which meaning just the velocities of stars in our galaxy going around galactic centers are wrong. They do not fall off as one of the square root of r as uh, they're supposed to by you know, Newton's law. They actually remain flat. That means there has to be much more mass in our galaxies than we ever see. Much more meaning that we only see 15%. So then, gravitational lensing shows that there should be much more mass in the universe on the way. But the most convincing evidence actually comes from cosmic microwave backgrounds. Because that puts us at 400,000 years after Big Bang, redshift 1100. And you see those black, uh, the kind of the dark spots, the blue spots, and the red spots. Those are differential temperatures that far back in the universe. So we know, we have experimental evidence, what were the temperature differences, and therefore, what were actually the overdensities, meaning how the matter started clumping from which to make galaxies afterwards at this point. And if you propagate this in time without the dark matter, it has to essentially propagate linearly. So multiplying 1100 to 10 to the minus 4 back to our time, shows you that there should not be any structures which we're seeing right now. There shouldn't be us. Normal matter doesn't have enough time to make galaxies by now, starting from the CMB. And that's one of the most, this is the evidence which cannot be explained by any modified gravity or any other theories besides the dark matter. So then, uh, why search for dark matter? Well, because it's there. And that's one of the greatest things about dark matter searches, because a lot of other new physics, it could be there, but doesn't have to be there. This has to be there. So 
And you can say, well, but we have a standard model. Could those stuff be dark matter? Well, let's look. Uh, nope. 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 It has to be stable because it has to exist from the start of the universe till now to make the galaxies. Or at least, I mean, it should be either do not decay or at least didn't decay till now. And this uh, neutrinos could contribute a little bit of dark matter, but there's just not enough of them. And they're too hot. Neutrinos is relativistic at the cosmic microwave background separation. It cannot clump at that time. So we need new particles. And if you have new particles, by the way, we also need new interactions to make those particles talk to standard model as well. Therefore, this, uh, of course, uh, it's the next question. OK, here's dark matter. What's the mass? We don't know. More than that, we really don't have any clue whatsoever. So this is our possible landscape. At this point, we have a Planck's mass. After this point, your particle becomes a black hole. Not good. And at this point, your dark matter is so light, your de Broglie wavelength is the size of the galaxy. It will not bind the smallest galaxy. So you could actually move this way if your, whatever your particle is, it's not 100% dark matter. But then we know what the galactic sizes are at this point. And uh, most of the searches you may have heard have been concentrated over here, this weakly interactive massive particles. Well, we haven't found any. I have the whole different talk about the dark matter, so I'm not going to talk about those. So now, let's say that dark matter is light. Light meaning less than one electron volt. First, a simple calculation of the Fermi velocity, okay, degeneracy pressure for fermions, tells you it cannot be fermionic anymore. Because escape velocity for our galaxy is about 600 kilometers per second. Fermi velocity is above that at 1 AV. Therefore, it has to be bosons. And uh, interesting things happen when you have light bosons together. Again, a simple calculation tells you that if you have a mass below about one electron volt, and if you ask what the Broglie volume is and how many particles are sitting in there, you're going to have large occupational numbers. <coughs> you're going to have more and more particles per de Broglie volume. <coughs> and at this point, they actually will not behave as individual particles anymore. They will behave as a wave. This is just cosine wave. There is, uh, so this is uh, your mass of your dark matter. So it essentially oscillates at the Compton frequency of your dark matter. And this is a dispersion because dark matter is virally supported, meaning there is a random velocity distribution of your particles is about 300 kilometers per second. So what happens when this dark matter talks to our normal matter and talks to our clocks? All we have to do, we just multiply this to our electronic Lagrangian. I'll, hope, I'll show how that looks like. <laughs> Take your F menu, F menu tensor we all know and love, and multiply it by the oscillating field. What does it do? Well, it makes all the energy levels oscillate with it. Therefore, it will make all the fundamental couplings oscillate it will make atomic energy level oscillate. Therefore, you can detect it again, but just monitoring the clock frequency ratios. But maybe with a bit different detection protocols. So what happens? Here is our normal, as, as I said, F menu, F menu tensor. This is our oscillating field. And this is a coupling constant. And what happens at now, this looks exactly as a normal electromagnetic tensor field. Therefore. Your alpha, which is defined by this term, your normal standard model alpha, has now a mixture of oscillating alpha in it. And that's what makes the clock frequencies oscillate. And then, of course, the next question from my experimental colleagues, at which frequency will it oscillate? OK, at the Compton, is the frequency related to the Compton uh, 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 frequency of dark matter? which is relates to its mass, and we don't know what its mass is. So we don't know at which frequency it will oscillate 
unfortunately. But we can actually also estimate to which frequencies the clocks would be sensitive to like this. If I just recalculate <coughs> my masses in electron volts to frequencies in hertz, we can see that at one second, which you have one oscillation per second, the mass of dark matter is about 10 to the minus 15 electron volts. And at about 10 to the minus 21, we at one oscillation per day. So at a limit of 20 to minus 22, we about at one oscillation per year. That's a long time to wait for it to oscillate, by the way, to make a measurement. But one second seems reasonable. That's something which is a reasonable clock probe time, your Ramsey time. So now, how would it work? We are going to measure the clock frequency ratio. We have the same sensitivity factors. All of that goes through variation of alpha. So again, the problem is that for the, all the current clocks, the sensitivity factors don't exceed six. And this is one of the issues. And then we plot the graph of coupling to your dark matter to normal matter. So we don't know this and we don't know this. So it's a parameter space plot because there are two quantities we don't know. So only thing which we do know, how much dark matter we have to have. So we know the density of dark matter in the local universe. So how would it work? OK, just keep taking your clock measurements. OK, maybe it's best to not have any dead time, of course. Meaning because usually you have to initialize your clock and wait, but you have two clocks. You can keep talking to one clock and then to another clock. So it's possible to do it. So you have your pi over two Ramsey pulse, you wait, another pi over two, you measure, and then you just keep doing it. So this is one coherent measurement, which means it's actually essential. <coughs> what is your stability at this one probe time? Because this is very heavily tied into which dark masses, dark matter masses you're sensitive to. So now we have our time sequence. And eventually, there is no point of measurement anymore because you either hit your clock ultimate sensitivity or you're outside of your dark matter coherence field. Because remember, we are talking about coherent wave. But eventually, we are going to be outside of the coherence bubble. And therefore, we are no longer dealing with actually the same phase. So we start losing sensitivity at that point as well. And that depends on the dark matter mass. So Q factor for dark matter is 10 to the 6, effectively. And then all you do, you just do a discrete Fourier transform. So you have a time series. You convert it to the frequency series. And in the frequency, you should have a peak at the dark matter Compton frequency. And uh, there is a little bit of a dispersion because Earth is actually moving through the dark matter field. Dark matter is not moving for purposes. <clears throat> How does that sequence restrict which dark matter masses we are sensitive to? By the way, this is actually a broadband search. This is not resonant. So you only do it once, and you set up limit to a lot of dark matter masses. So what dark matter masses are on the right on the left? First. If you have oscillatory signal, which oscillates faster than your integration time, you're going to smear it off, right? So you could not have multiple oscillations while you're just waiting between the pi over two pulses. Unless you start using dynamic decoupling, quantum information, uh, additional, nice additional pulses, and then it works. But in principle, we shouldn't have more than one. And also, we should get at least one dark matter oscillation during this time. So in the first particle physics paper, there was a statement that you only need one data point to get the frequency. Do you think it's right? You're doing a Fourier transform. How many data points should you have to actually restore the frequency? So to get the frequency right, how many measurements do you have to make? Who can guess? OK, is one enough? I hear no. OK. How many? Two? OK, but my two point, one point, two points. How do I get the frequency? No, that's what I'm saying. The Nyquist limit 
this too, but as an experimentalist, I'd be demanding more. So I would go with at least four. Four. So in fact, I actually, uh, I actually done the simulation. Okay, ask my experimental husband to do the simulation. Okay. So uh, and uh, the simulation, you need four to five. So because you can get the frequency, but not the right frequency if you have two. Because the frequency starts shifting if you don't have enough points, which was a very nice illustration. Uh, you just embed, you know, inject the signal in your uh, comparisons, and then you see that uh, it doesn't work if you just have uh, less than one point. Oh, okay. Oh, excuse me, less than four to five points. And that unfortunately also shifts the limits toward the light masses again. So now. I made my particle physics colleagues about unhappy about it because they want heavier masses because they want dark matter to solve some other problems, so they need it heavier rather than lighter. So now, here is the current limits. So here is excluded region, and uh, those are present scalar dark matter limits. Everything which is in yellow would have to be excluded. So this is a microscope mission. So this is equivalence principle mission in space. This is a classical mission. It has nothing to do with atomic clocks or quantum sensors. But again, in space, it means very expensive. And now, those are all the limits, actually, from clocks, meaning that uh, these, the red ones, are dysprosium data. And then the green ones are rubidium to cesium data, which we have 15 years of. Those were not dedicated dark matter search experiments. Those were existing data we analyzed. And that's, by the way, you have those two things. Because this was a Lorentz violation measurement. That was not actually ever designed to look for dark matter. And then they had the two years of measurement, which are here, and then 24 hours of measurements, which are here. Because now you're in a different mass scale. The questions to pose here, how, where do we go from this point on? How do we move this curve down? Because the further it is, the larger our chances of actually detecting dark matter. And how also we get to heavy and heavy masses. Because, for example, one of the dark matter scenarios, the relaxion, it actually solves a very important hierarchy problem. But it has to be heavier than about 10 to the minus 11. So one possibility is to actually use quantum formation technology and use dynamic decoupling. So on top of your normal Ramsey sequence, you start applying the pi pulses at your clock frequency, <clears throat> and that allows you to actually extract the signal. On the other hand, just how many pi pulses can you apply perfectly? Let's say kilohertz. 10? Can you do 100? And that actually changes depending whom I talk to. <laughs> so, but again, we are talking like 10 years in the future. So those quantum formation technologies, how to actually get rid of noise and how to extract the signals, are very important to investigate for uh, also for this fundamental physics searches. And uh, there is another dark matter scenario. And this is even much more fun. You can blame it for your, all your experimental problems. Dark matter can clump. So think about a ferromagnet. So you have some random um, you know, spin direction somewhere, and then you cool it below a certain temperature. And what happens? You make domains when you have a very certain orientation. And the universe is kind of like that. So we had a very hot universe. And we have those light scalar fields in it. And then it cool down. And uh, it's quite possible that field actually made domains. So it means on this part of a domain, alpha is different from on that part of a domain. Does it seem weird to you? OK. So if you're passing through one of those domains, I'm sure we'll find out with our all precision devices doing strange things. Um, OK. But it's possible to actually make different kind of what's called a topological defects dark matter. And you can have those domain walls. You can have monopoles. Or you can have fuzzy strings. 
my colleagues were unclear of how those fuzzy strings looks like. So uh, besides the fact that it's some sort of extended object, and by extended, it means it could be Earth-sized. And think about what that thing will do to the GPS or all of your precision measurement devices. When it's passing through, it will actually, for a while, will change alpha, and then it will actually get restored back. So your clocks will desynchronize and then resynchronize back. Not just clock, every single precision device in the world. Uh, you can get a black box from Dmitry Butker that it will actually synchronize your precision experiment into the chain of those network uh, magnetometers and now be clocks and thermometers as well. So the there are limits on those types of structures passing through Earth, and those for this you do need a network of clocks. So also, to get better and better searches for this oscillatory dark matter, if you have a network of clock, you have an extra square root of n factor which to improve your searches. And the important question is, how do we actually reach the possible ultimate uncertainties our technologies will allow us? So how should you be searching for the dark matter with clocks? And the first thing, of course, if you want to improve the current clocks, and the great thing about it, metrology institutes and uh, universities will do it regardless of dark matter searches. So that's a, one of the great things about the quantum sensors that for fundamental physics, there are great reasons to improve quantum sensors, period, for all of those things which have nothing to do with dark matter. And then there are many, many ways to achieve this. So one question I'm asked, OK, so we have this rise of quantum sensors and technologies. Where are we, where are we on this curve? Like, are we close to flattening out? No, we actually just started. There is enormous possibility for the improvement. Because even the clocks are already 10 to minus 18, there is really, really many, many other things which we can do. For example, to improve stability, Instead of having single ions, you can do ion chains and large ion crystals. And you will hear a talk by Mary Barrett, who actually have incredible program here with a lutetium plus clock, which can actually be run as a multi-ion clock and clock with a large column crystals. Because remember, you need great short-term stability. No tricks besides increasing number of atoms will improve the short-term stability. Because all of them will just increase the prop time, and that pushes your dark matter masses towards the uh, uh, lighter bounds. And then oh, there is already one 3D optical lattice clock when eventually, hopefully, I can put a million atoms in there. And there's a very interesting many body physics is happening in there, by the way. It's a great many body simulator. Because there are all interesting collective effects when you put putting that many degenerate atoms in there. And then the thing which people have been working on for a very long time of how to measure beyond the quantum limit. And the first proof of principle experiments already exist and showed improvement, but no meteorologically useful squeezings was yet achieved. Besides, of course, the LIGO now works in the squeeze limit. But still, this is the next five to 10 years. And then the next interesting things, all of those quantum sensors use your position. None of them use entanglement. And that's a shame, because there is all this quantum information effort of how to entangle particles, and we're not still utilizing it. So the interesting question is what new things you can achieve when you actually start using entanglement in uh, your systems, where is this going to be a new resource, or is it simply you actually be able to improve your precision? So the interesting question, again, depends very significantly whom I talk to, how far the rabbit hole goes. OK, 10 to the minus 10, 19, pretty much everyone agrees that it does. 20, 21, 22, at a certain point, if you have your optical lattice crystal, there is a gravitational difference between different lattice sites, which is going to be very interesting, actually, uh, meteorologically to explore. And then, of course, there is another route. Besides, of course, improving the current clocks, you can ask yourself the next question. If I were to build a dedicated device, which is a clock, to search for dark matter, what will I use? Other systems, when you can get actually very large enhancement factor, 100 or more, meaning that you have 
orders of magnitude of extra sensitivity for free. <coughs> so <coughs> these are key factors for all of the current clocks. The strontium plus, the terbium, so these are lattice clocks with excellent stability. Okay, strontium 0 0.06. So you can actually get around it. You can actually, cavity, which is used for strontium laser, is so good. You can just compare actually clock to cavity. That you give sensitivity of 1. So that's all already being done. And then here is the mercury plus at minus 3, and here are the single ion clocks, both of them so far. Hopefully there will be more ions, but this is it. There is not a single clock operating now which has sensitivity more than minus 6. By the way, this is why this limit actually hold on for more than 10 years. And I'm very much looking forward to seeing new results from PTB when comparing this clock. So what we need, we need a very precise frequency standards using new systems with very, very large K. Okay, but we already have neutral atoms and singly charged ions. What else? Well, there are two things. One, why not nuclear transitions? And the second thing is why not highly charged ions? And there was first superb experiments of the first demonstration of the quantum logic spectroscopy with the highly charged ions, which you will hear by Pete Schmidt today. So I will not talk about highly charged ions. I will talk a little bit about nuclear clock. So why not nuclear transitions? What's wrong with the nuclear transitions as clock transitions? Who can tell me? Yes? You cannot find them. You cannot drive them. OK, why can't you drive them? Yes. Well, okay. Maybe nuclear physicists a little bit know where they are. Those are in mega electron volts. So uh, three electron volts. It's about optical visible transition. This is a 10 to the six mega electron volts. I'm already asked by my physic particle physics colleagues. Of course, you know, can we ever have this lasers? Okay, this is not question to me. So. Uh, we do not have lasers anywhere close to this region. So even if we were to have lasers, we don't have frequency comps to make measurements on those. However, there is a single exception in our idea instead of the using atomic transition, using now nuclear transition. There is exactly one, one nuclear, where by some freak of nature, you can actually have 8.3 electron volts. OK, this is 150 nanometers. In the initial proposal back in 2003, that was a supposed to be 3 electron volts, which was turned out to be wrong. But at this point, it actually has been recently, re recently measured, and it is uh, uh, at about 150 nanometers. There are already frequency comps which you can actually construct for that. Why would we like to do that? Besides the incredible thing of excites a nuclear transition by a laser, which will be very interesting, we think that there is enormous enhancement for variation of alpha. More than that, there also enhancement for variation of the <coughs> quark masses to the QCD scale, so which gives us access to the gluonic fields and to the quarks, which particle physicists are particularly interested in, because that is actually more, even more realistic scenarios than coupling to the electromagnetic tensors. Why would do we think so? OK, what is a normal energy scale in a nuclei? The Coulomb energy in a nuclei compensated by the nuclear binding energy. So binding energy works this way, Coulomb energy works this way, nuclear remains bound. And the scale of this Coulomb contribution, this is one giga electron volt. This is 10 to the 9, very large number. So what we think are happening that the Coulomb contribution difference, which is about MEV scale, it's almost perfectly compensated by the difference in binding energy. So your difference in the energy scale, which is actually your, tells you our sensitivity, is 10 to the 6. And then you divide it by actual transition energy, which is 8. And then you get 10 to the 5, or maybe even 10 to the 6 enhancement factor. <clears throat> the theorist, I have difficulty believing that nine significant figures can cancel to zero accidentally. So we are not exactly sure what the sensitivity is. 
but it's likely to be 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5. There is actually uh, experiments in progress to actually find out exactly what this difference is, at least within certain nuclear models. So uh, European Research Council just actually funded uh, the, um, the synergy grant for the development of the nuclear clock. So it will be a very interesting thing to go from one significant figure to 18 significant figures in a short time, hopefully. And now I'm going to skip the Lorentz invariance. And uh, uh, this is actually an interesting exp another experiment with clocks. And I will talk about just this one thing, being atomic theorist. I would like to advertise our new project. To make an online portal which tells you what the atomic data are, even if it actually doesn't have them in the database. So it's going to be like Star Trek, computer, calculate. So the idea is that for the first thing, we are going to have all alkalis, alkaline earth ions, alkaline earth, essentially everything which atomic ultra-cold community is using most frequently. All the transition matrix elements would be in there. And also you can ask the computer, what is my light shift or my potential, for example, for my rubidium, strontium, whatever else atom I have, at this level, at this frequency, and it will plot your graph. Eventually, we, in three years, we're going to release all the codes which we have. They'll all be made user-friendly. And uh, hopefully, in within many years, eventually, we are going to have the full periodic table in there. We are not there yet, because there are no theory methods yet to do the full periodic table, but we hope to get there. And that's uh, our my other life of doing that precision of my calculations. So I would like to summarize that atomic clocks have a great potential for discovering new physics. So these are not only quantum, superb quantum sensors and metrology devices, but also the dark matter search devices, tests of your fundamental physics principles, and searches for new discoveries. And many, many new exciting developments are coming in the next 10 years. And especially here for the Center for Quantum uh, Technologies, I'm very interested to hear more ideas. We need new ideas of how to use quantum technologies for new physics searches. For example, how do we actually use entanglement as a resource? Or also, what quantum technologies we can use to improve the stability of the clocks in the comparison for the precision of the clocks? Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you.